Many of us watch J.R. Martinez on the 13th season of Dancing with the Stars. He came into our hearts through our devices, through our televisions, and he was a winner in more ways than one. He's an Army veteran, a brain survivor, an actor, a motivational speaker, a New York Times best-selling author, and he has traveled the world speaking with troops at various bases, as well as serving as the keynote speaker for numerous major corporate events, nonprofits, universities, and Fortune 500 companies. JR devotes himself to spreading his message of resilience and optimism, and I am delighted to have him. JR, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Oh, my goodness. You know, um, I'm just so thrilled to have you here. Uh, you already know that I've been such a fan of yours and that I was a <laughs> voter. And that's saying a lot because I don't do the voting. Uh, <laughs> it honored me so much, not just through your dance, but through your whole life story. For our family listening who may not know your story, especially what happened in 2003 and your journey mm -hmm. since then, can we jump right into it? I'd love you to walk through what led you to join the military and what happened for you in Iraq and immediately after. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, so for me, you know, my mother's from Central America. My mother's from El Salvador. Um, I grew up, my mother raised me by herself and I you know, at an early age was self-aware of what I had. And although as kids and as people, as adults, we do this as well, we have a tendency to get caught up in that comparison game. And I, you know, found myself no different than a lot of my peers comparing, oh, they have the nice, you know, they have the clothes or they have the shoes or they have this. And I wish I had that or um, you know, early on, I remember going to El Salvador with my mother a few times. I went a few times before I graduated from high school. And I had this perspective that was introduced to me that allowed me to appreciate what I did have in this country. So I may not have been able to have all the things that I wanted, but I definitely had everything that I needed. I mean, I had a roof over my head. I had a mother that worked hard, that provided a lot. I mean, if I wanted to go get something to eat, I can go get something to eat. It wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, it was like, I mean, listen, I wasn't eating lavishly, but nonetheless, I can go out to eat if I wanted to. And what that did is that gave me a, a deeper appreciation for this country. And despite its flaws, which we all have our flaws, there was a deeper appreciation for what this country gave to my mother and therefore gave to me and my family. And when 9-11 happened, I was a senior in high school, and I remember watching it on TV and just thinking to myself, wow, and just trying to comprehend, just trying to comprehend, like many people, what was going on. And um, and then, you know, I listen, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that that was the sole reason why I decided to join the military. There were many variables that factored in. I, I mean, I tried to go to college and you know, listen, I was very stuck in the, you know, listen, we've all been told to do that exercise where you get a sheet of paper and you take a pen and you write out, you know, where you want to be in six months or six years or whatever the time frame may be. And the problem with that, at least in my experience has been, is that when you write that in ink, if when you come back to that point and you're like, man, six months, I'm supposed to be here and you're not there. A lot of us have a tendency to say, well, forget it. Things are not going my way. I'm just going to give up. I quit, right? Or whatever term you want to utilize. And what I've learned over, you know, since then is, yeah, you got to write things down in pencil because there's always room to, you know, there's always some room to kind of erase some things. It's like, ah, wait a minute. Okay, what I thought I wanted in six months is not necessarily what I should be doing in six months or everyone's trajectory is different. And so... You know, I wanted to go to college and I wanted to play football. And unfortunately, I wasn't, you know, I was able to go to college. I wasn't going to be able to play football for two years because of academics. And of course, that wasn't what I wanted. You know, I was stubborn and, you know, young kid out of high school wasn't what I wanted. So I just decided, well, I'm not going to go to college then. If I can't play ball, that's what I want to do. And I just kind of, I got a job locally in the town that I grew up in and, 
or graduated from high school in, and I just was going through the motions. And then, you know, as cliche as it may seem, I saw a commercial one day at, on TV and it talked about the military. Mm-hmm. And I went and spoke to a recruiter and, you know, I spoke to all the branches, but I went to an army recruiter and they said, listen, this is, this is the information. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, I think I figured it out. I think I know exactly what I want to do with my life. And um, and it wasn't necessarily my life. That, I, that's actually not correct. I, I was only thinking I was going to do three years. That was it. And it was my way of giving back to this country. It was my way of getting money for college. It was my way of traveling, seeing the world. It, it was my way of kind of getting away from the small town. And I'd always had this dream as a kid that there was this whole world out there that I wanted to see. I wanted to experience. I wanted to be part of that world. And the military was my opportunity to fulfill all of those things. And, you know, listen, my mother was not a fan of me wanting to join the military in 2002, which was a year after 9-11, and we were already in Afghanistan. And so we as a country were in conflict. My mother didn't, didn't support that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of, the, one of the gifts that my mother did give me as a child was her willingness to sit down and listen to me. And I think as, and and that's something I really try to do as a parent now, where I may not agree, I may not understand why my kids want to do whatever it is that they want to do, but I'm going to sit down and give them a little bit of time for them to kind of work through those thoughts and be able to feel comfortable that they can come to me and communicate those things. Because that is something my mother did for me. And even though she was against the idea, I remember sitting down with her and saying, let me break it down for you, why I, why I want to do this. And um, at the conclusion of that conversation, she said, okay, I support you. So I joined the army. I went to basic training and just to give people a timeline, I don't want to be too tedious, but you know, September of 2002 is when I joined and I was in basic training until December of 2002, January of 2003, I was assigned to my unit in March of 2003, I was on a plane going overseas and in April, 5th, on April 5th, 2003, so literally a few days shy of me being in country one month, I was driving a Humvee through a city called Karbala with three other service members in the Humvee with me, and we ran over a roadside bomb, and it immediately exploded. The other three troops were thrown out of the vehicle. I was trapped inside, and within a matter of seconds, this Humvee was engulfed in flames, and I was pinned, and I was completely conscious going through this excruciating pain, and... You know, as much as I can sit here and go into great detail about, I remember seeing my hands and seeing the way my hands were changing. And I'm, I'll leave the detail there and leave it up to the imagination to sort of fill in the blank. But um, the, 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 the thing that I tend to focus on at this stage of my life about that period, about that, but that point in my life is this. I remember as I was in the Humvee and I was pinned and I couldn't get out and I was feeling this excruciating pain. I remember looking out through the front of the Humvee and seeing chaos and seeing people just running around. And there were many instances in the, in between each gasp for air, in between each scream for someone to please come and you know help me and pull me out. My eyes would get really heavy and they would be on the verge of closing and they would close. And I would allow them to close. And in that moment of my eyes being closed, there was this calmness, this peacefulness. I didn't feel the pain. All I felt was my breath. All I thought about was my mother's worst fear. I thought about me being 19 and my life was going to end this way and I was never going to do X, Y, and Z. And if you talk to anybody that has had a similar experience, I think all of them would confirm that time has this really interesting way of just slowing down in that scenario. And and then I would remind myself, if I keep my eyes closed, I'm giving up. I can't give up. And I would open my eyes and I would continue that vicious cycle of screaming and yelling and gasping for air. And the reason I focus on that is because I'm in a stage in my life, I'm 40 years old Mm -hmm. and I'm getting back, I'm getting back to a place where I'm starting to take care of myself a little bit better than I have been over the last few years. I've been conditioned to go, 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 go and do, 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 do and spread yourself so thin, 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 thin and never take inventory of the bandwidth of what you can take on and what you should, 
you know, maybe kind of say, hey, man, I can't do that right now. Um, that's not the best use of my time or energy, et cetera. And I've been practicing yoga. And yoga for me is not about the physical component. That's a that's the extra bonus for me. For me, it's about getting me back to that stillness, getting me back to that breath work, getting me back to connecting to me. And I have for the last 21 years um, and through my recovery that I almost spent two and a half years in a hospital recovery, I have really tried to focus on in the mix of all the chaos, how do I silence it? Mm-hmm. No matter where I am, no matter what's happening, I could be in the middle of New York City and I can find a space where I can close my eyes and I can go inward and block out all the noise. And I think that that is something that is incredibly important for so many people to exercise that because like I said, we are in a society where we're constantly conditioned to just go and do and take on. And we're not one allowed taught, let alone allowed to pause, to sit still, but then we're also not comfortable being still. We're not comfortable listening to ourselves to paying attention to ourselves. And um, so, you know, it's, it's, There was a, 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 I mean, there were so many beautiful lessons that came from this experience. And I live by those things till this day, that breath work, finding gratitude and finding things to be grateful for, even though, you know, maybe from the outside you're thinking, or maybe even when you're in it, you're like, there is absolutely nothing to be grateful for because I feel like. I can't breathe. Like, I feel like the the weight of the world is on my shoulders right now. I feel like I, I'm going to lose this. This is not, I don't have control. I, I don't know what's going to come. And I, all those feelings are valid and you're okay to feel those things. But then you also need to sort of stop and feel, you know, other things and, and, and reflect and remind yourself how far you've come. So, I mean, listen, I can spend hours just talking about what I've learned from this experience and how at a certain point in my life, I called it, it was a it was a tragic event, but thank God I'm in a position in my life and I've done a lot of work and I've surrounded myself with a lot of great people where now I can look at the 5th of April of 2003 and actually call it, call it a blessing. Well, you know, the, the, the blessing in that, wow. Uh, but you consider it a gift. You are a gift to so many of us. I mean, your resilience and courage following your in, injury while serving in Iraq has touched so many lives, has saved so many lives. How did you find the strength to reach gratitude? How did you find the strength to overcome such adversity and embrace new opportunities, JR? I mean, there are people, and I'm sure you know some of them, who can't love, work, and live with some of them, who face a lot less if we measure tragedy or circumstance and don't find that strength. Was it the tremendousness of it? Was it some individual gift giving you? Was it gritting grind, combination? How did you find the strength? to get to gratitude. You know, so, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're in a a time in our world where, you know, there's constant conversation about data, right? Everyone's trying to gather data and everyone's doing research to get data to then better understand how to do this and how to do that, how to tweak their business model, how to tweak their product, how to market themselves better, who to market themselves to. Um, There's all this conversation about research and data. And I believe that our lives are literally just one big research project and we are constantly gathering data. And so I have been gathering data for 21 plus years since my injury. (laughs) I mean, I have, there's so much evidence of that. And and so, you know, again, I don't expect a big splash to happen. Not every day is going to be a dancing with the stars moment, right? That where it's like this big, incredible platform, millions of people you're exposed to. It's my coming out party in a sense, because prior to me being on the show, even though I was an actor, 
on a, all my children for three years, people still looked at me as a disabled veteran and they still classified me as a burn victim. Mm -hmm. And I was neither of the two. I was, I'm a veteran and I'm a burn survivor. <laughs> and so dancing with the stars was my opportunity to show the world that I'm so much more. And how did I get to that place though? Listen, I'm incredibly confident. I have, I have so much confidence. Like, I, I mean, listen, I, I feel like you could put me in a lineup with, with with the grooviest you know sexiest you know most handsome whatever term you want to utilize the people and i guarantee i would flow right with them I, I'd, I'd be able to vibe i'd be able to hold my own baby that's how i feel and but how did i get to this point where there are so many of these you know moments over the course of my life that just gave me a little bit of life that I just mm -hmm. paid attention to. And I don't consider things to be coincidences. Listen, I'm a Southern boy through and through. I was <laughs> born in Louisiana, grew up in Arkansas, graduated high school in Georgia. And in the South, we call, besides saying, bless your heart, we call those things God winks. Mm -hmm. And those are God winks. Those are coincidences. Those are, those are directions. Those are signs as we sort of travel on this road of life that is directing us, that is telling us, ooh, slow down here, stop here, hey, go this way, detour. You know, there's all these things that we have to pay attention to. And most of us just kiss this up as like, that's an interesting coincidence. By the fourth, fifth time, come on, man. It's not a coincidence anymore. Life is trying to tell you something. And for some odd reason, because you're too damn stubborn, you're sitting here trying to say, no, 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 I'm going to go another way, right? And so from, are you too afraid? That's the other thing as well. So listen, six months after I was injured, well, actually, a couple months into my injury, like I remember I was in this negative space because I had lost my identity, my mm -hmm. identity of being in the military, being able to serve. I was told I can't stay in the army. I had lost the identity of my appearance, the way I look for 19 years of my life. I was always called handsome and pretty boy and, you know, had this curly hair and whatever. And that was my identity. And then I looked in the mirror and I had no idea who that individual was. Mm -hmm. And so I fell into this really negative space and I just wished that I would have just died because as much as everybody was happy that I was alive, I was thinking to myself, well, I'm never going to truly live. And there's a difference between being alive and actually living. And for me, it really came down one day when my mother and I had a heart to heart. She said, listen, I don't know why this happened to you. I don't know why this happened, but all I'm asking you to do is try to find that JR, that JR that's always has this upbeat attitude, good energy. Try to be that, try to find him. And in that moment, it was my opportunity to truly listen to my mom and say, you know what? Okay. All right. That's, that's what I'm going to do. And so every morning when I woke up, I try to find something to be grateful for. And you would look at me and say, well, man, there probably isn't a lot to be grateful for, but you know what? I woke up certain mornings and my hands, I can have more mobility. I can walk around the hospital a little bit more. I can feed myself a little bit easier. I was, there was progress. And so that kind of carried me. It gave me enough life. And I started to practice that every single day. And it made things, I don't want to say easy because it's not easy, but it made it manageable. And it caused, a, it created enough of a distraction for me not to focus on all the challenges and the hardships instead i was able to focus on the beautiful things and um so that's that then six months after i was injured i'm asked to visit a patient i didn't want to i was really reluctant to do that but nonetheless i finally kind of said fine i'll try it and i went and talked to him and i realized i was able to sort of change his thought process and his trajectory and i thought to myself huh maybe there's something to that and so i started visiting patients every single day in between, in between my own appointments and that it reintroduced me to my purpose and my identity and service. And so there's another example of another moment that in the grand scheme of my bio isn't going to make the bio because it's not sexy enough. It's not shiny enough, but that is mm -hmm. such a foundational piece to who I am today is putting myself in uncomfortable spaces, leaning into it and having conversation and so there's that. And now that feeling starts to carry me for six months. And then, you know, a year after I'm injured, I meet Oprah. I get, wow, I get to talk to Oprah. And I'm talking to Oprah. And I'm 20 years old, a year out of my injury. And, ooh, that carries me a little bit longer. And I, I'm constantly just building on all these different experiences when I started speaking. And I started speaking to maybe 25, 50 people. And, okay, half the room were 
you know, re- receptive to what I had to say and, you know, welcome what I had to say and welcome what I had to offer. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is, that's good too. Now I'm getting more confidence when, you know, I was 19 when I was injured. So I'm turning 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. And, you know, what matters to me is I want to get out in the world and I want to meet somebody. I want to have, you know, I want to be able to date. I want to be able to hug somebody and, you know, all of a sudden I was able to, you know, meet some people and I started realizing people are gravitating to me and it had really nothing to do with my appearance and everything to do with who I was as a person and how I showed up. And listen, I'm, I'm 40. I got two beautiful children. My wife is bomb as hell. Like, she, I mean, I mean, she is a beautiful woman. And, you know, I was named as one of the sexiest men alive at one point with People Magazine. Like, I mean, the things that I never thought were going to be a reality, but started to, I started to just build on these moments that were happening. And over time, you have enough of those moments you pay attention to. That's a puzzle. Mm-hmm. And now you've got a foundation. So when people say you're faced with trauma and adversity or some life altering event, and you say, I got to start all over, start all over. What I want people to understand is you're not really starting all over. Maybe the house what you see from the street is not there anymore, but the foundation is still there. Now there may be some foundation that is cracked and you may have to work on that, but you ain't starting over. Nah, there ain't no starting over. You're just rebuilding and rebuilding something maybe even better than what you previously had. You are just so speaking to my soul and I'm sure (laughs) everyone who's listening right now is receiving Receiving from this, you talked about collecting data along the way, and data is so important, and oftentimes we don't treat every experience as an opportunity to gather data, oftentimes with that God wink attack that you talk mm-hmm. about. You know, when you speak to my soul, let me share with you that um, not many years ago, I had an accident as well, and I was on a flight. We'd all stood up to retrieve our packages from overhead. And the gentleman immediately behind me had one of those old school briefcases with the hard corners. And it's oh, no. here. My face scared small children. Can you relate to what I'm talking about? Yes, right? 100%. Oh, JR, it, 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 it just tore me apart. The interesting thing is, we landed in Los Angeles, and I was going to speak at uh, NBC Universal mm. in an auditorium. And I sent a message to my uh, contact there saying, I'm not going to be able to do it. I look a wreck. You know, I'm I'm l- l- loving part. And she responded, we have all of these people lined up here for you. Many have flown in. If if there's any way you can get past your immediate emotion, I promise you they're more interested in what you have to say than how you look. And I thought, did you hear pain? I mean, JR, I'm laughing. Did you read my notes? And I'm not being able to laugh because it hurt to laugh. It hurt to laugh. I love laughing. My brother was with me, as he was so often during that time. We worked together. And he encouraged me, go ahead and do it. Just ask them not to film it. And they agreed to it. Everybody received really well. Time progressed in the immediate months after that. And I started to shy away from external activities, only meeting with people inside my company. My daughter and my son sat me down one evening as adults. um, And because my husband had said, I'll I'll support whatever decision you make. You'll always be, you know, the beautiful woman I married. Mm -hmm. I do see where you have issue with your appearance. Our kids sat me down. And my son said, mom, people are more interested in what's coming out of your head than what's on your face. Mm. And my daughter said, you're not going to get better staying home. You'll only get better getting out. And Mm. he introduced me to acupuncturists who worked with me. And I got to where I am now. But even as you were talking, I started to feel some of that same pain and 
stiffening that often occurs for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm living through it again as you were sharing it. And you bring it to such a bright place. JR, from your perspective, what do you consider the key qualities or strategies that many of us may cultivate? <laughs> Excuse me. That many of us may cultivate to navigate life's unexpected challenges. Listen, I got to first and foremost, just take a second to applaud you and just kind of throw it back on you in a sense. And I think what you just exuberated and what you just shared with all of us, and I think your willingness to just show up. And, you know, what I love about what you shared was, um, you know, you you consulted with a couple of people you trust and, and you love and you you were vulnerable. And that's what I heard. You were vulnerable and you shared your fears and your concerns with, you know, those closest to you about why you didn't want to do this. And uh, at the conclusion, you listen and you showed up. And what I also love is that as parents, I think we often get caught up in this trap of where we believe we're the parents, we're the adults, we know everything. And yeah, we know a lot more than our kids. I get that. But our kids are our are, are greatest teachers. Our, our, our kids are constantly telling us and showing us things that we need to work on. We need to identify. We need to um, we need to pay attention to. I mean, our kids are our greatest teachers. And what I applaud you for doing is when your kids sat you down, despite your husband saying, hey, whatever you want, I got you. Um, you were willing to listen to your children. And, and, and I think there's a lot of people that would, 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 would completely have pushback on that, that situation. Um, you know, I, I, I have many examples of it in my life of people that I love dearly that, you know, when I tried to, you know, come to them with constructive criticism, not an attack, um, but because of where they were emotionally, uh, they, they unfortunately perceived it as an attack when it never was the intention for it to be that. And therefore, it prevented them from actually hearing anything that I actually said. Instead, they went <laughs> on the defense. And so I think being able to be in a space where you can emotionally be healthy and mature enough to be able to respond in that way, I applaud you 100% for showing up in that way. Um you know, I think for me, I think the key, I, I'm in a space where I'm really having this conversation about vulnerability. And as a male, and as a, as someone who served in the military, someone who played sports, uh, vulnerability is not a word that is part of the, that should be part of the vocabulary. Um, a lot of people maybe know the word, but they don't know what it feels like. And, and feeling vulnerability and knowing the definition of vulnerability are two very different things. And I didn't know vulnerability for a very long time until I was 24 years old. So almost five years after I was injured and I was in a really uh, emotionally, I was, I was really in a bad place. I mean, I could tell you that I was angry and I was drinking and I was just lashing out and I, I burned a lot of bridges and hurt a lot of people just because I was hurt. I was a hurt person. And unfortunately I just didn't know how to manage that and direct that energy um, in the best way possible, but it, it took my best friend who literally went one night, I tried to fight him. <laughs> I mean, I tried to hmm. fight him and, and I'm five foot nine, 200 pounds. And this man is six foot five, 275 pounds. Like, I mean, this man is, is, is he's a machine. <laughs> and I tried to fight him. That tells you that I was not in the right state of mind. And I remember um, instead of him engaging in that when he could have, he instead told me to, he told me to sit in his car and he told me to cry. And mm. I was like, what? And he was like, you just need to cry. He's like, you've healed physically, you haven't healed emotionally or mentally, you need to cry. And I was like, I don't have need you, to cry about anything. Have you intentionally or consciously cried between the time in Iraq and then? So I spent a lot of time and I'm a big advocate and a fan of when you feel it, you got to lean into it. 
And I know, like, I'm a big fan of, like, man, I don't know why at this stage of my life, like I said, I'm 40, but I feel like over the last, it, I feel like it's been since my daughter was born, and she's 11 now. She was born in 2012, and I feel like ever since 2012, I don't know, man, there's things that just all of a sudden just hit me, hit me a certain way, and I was like, I get emotional. Like, I could be on a plane listening to music or watching a show, and then all of a sudden something just strikes me, and I just, I just get teary-eyed. I don't know. Like I watch a movie, of, it could be an animated movie with my kids. And I'm like, why am I crying? You know what I mean? Like it just looks so emotional lately. But, you know, the thing that I really spend a lot of time, and I'm not afraid of saying this, I'm, I'm open and honest. And I think that's the only real way to be able to connect with people. I think if you're able to have humility and if you're able to have vulnerability, I think that is, um, those are great assets of, people that are leaders. And I believe everybody is a leader. Um, the most basic, we can have a whole discussion about leadership and really get to the weeds of it. But the basic form of leadership is modeling the way. How do you move mm. through the spaces that you navigate? How do you respond? Like people are always watching you, paying attention to you. And most of us don't even realize that. And so when we sort of roll our eyes at something or when we cross our arms or when we look up into space and we don't want to make eye contact, people are watching. Now, all of a sudden, you've now influenced that person that is watching you in this space. Now they're going to start reacting and responding that same way. Now someone else is watching that person that watched you. And now they're like, why is he or she doing that? Okay, now. So now you have influenced two or three or four or five, 10, 15, 20 people, depending on what your circle is. And so the most basic form of leadership is modeling the way, right? And so I want people to understand that. And so for me, between that time of me being injured and my best friend and I having that interaction, oh boy, were there a lot of tears. Listen, it probably wasn't the best thing for me to be doing, but I would go home to my mom's house in Georgia and, and go into my room and my room looked out into, you know, it's like this tree line and I you know, would sit there in the middle of the night and everybody would be asleep. And I would be in my room, sitting in a chair, facing out the window and only seeing the moonlight, literally, that's the only light that was shining down into the tree line. And I would just write and I would cry and I would just write. And, I'm, and, and, and I think that was the most healthiest thing that I can do was write. And a lot of it, I was mad and angry but that's okay. I needed to get that out. And that was a safe way and a space for me to be able to do that. I love that I was able to write it because years later, I was able to go back and read it and then realize and appreciate the journey and how much I've grown. And I don't get paralyzed by post-traumatic stress anymore. I now get elevated by post-traumatic post -traumatic growth. And so wow. you have, you have to be able to, to, to be able to reflect and go back. And so for me, I was always crying, but I never showed it in front of it and outside of those walls. I never told anybody that I cried. And it wasn't until my best friend that sat me in the passenger seat and he was, he said, you need to cry. And I was like, I don't need to cry. What are you talking about? I don't need to cry. And literally I started crying because I was hurting and all I needed to feel was a safe space. And my friend didn't say, here's a book. Or here's a podcast that talks about vulnerability. He modeled the way. He created a space that made me feel safe. And let me tell you how important that, that moment was and how much of an impact it had on my life. So every time that he and I interacted prior to that moment, he would always end the conversation, whether it was over the phone or in person, by telling me he loved me. And now my father left when I was nine months old. He, you know, there was no man in my life. And... So I was in condition to hear another man tell me he loves me and for me to let alone repeat that back. And so every time he said that, I'd be like, all right, bro, I'll talk to you later. Like, it was just kind of weird for me that he would say that to me. Well, literally that night when I cried and, you know, I started to really share a lot of things and I just kind of just like all these emotions started to flood out. I was the first one that looked at him and said, I love you. And it, and it was because of a feeling and that's the thing, that's the beautiful thing about, a, about humanity is that we spend so much time finding reasons why you and I are not the same. And what we should be paying attention to is what makes us the same and why there's so much intersectionality between all of our lives is because we're human beings that are feeling. We all feel, we all know what a feeling is like. 
right? I may not know what it was like to be on that plane and to have that that object, you know, strike you in the way that it did and affect you, you know, but I remember, I, I can connect with that feeling because I've had something similar. And so instead of me saying like, oh, I don't understand. And so, you know, I, there's a division there. No, I connect with the feeling of how that made you feel. I connect with the feeling of how you felt vulnerable and how your identity shifted. I connect with that emotion. And that is what we should always be connected with on a human level, because first and foremost, before anything else, what we are is human beings and we need to be, we need to be human. And so for me, you know, it's, it's now, you know, he's, he's, he's 17 years older than me. He's like my big brother. He's like a father figure. He's like, you know, he's like the godfather, the grandfather, the uncle to my children. Like he's everything to my family. And I'm like, he could call me right now. And I could I could be like, hey, what's up, Dan? And he's like, hey, I got a quick question. I'm like, all right, cool. What's up? And he's like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, cool. All right, love you. Love you too. Hang up. And he mm-hmm. calls me right back. And he's like, oh, I forgot to ask one more thing. What is it? All right, this and this and this. All right, love you. Love you too. Bye. And it's just like, it's just such a second nature for us now as men to be able to show that. And I have been able to take that gift that he gave me and share it with so many other people in my circle. And I'm going to say everybody, but I'm going to say more specifically men that I've served with in the military, that we they also weren't conditioned that same way. I got my boys now. We're like, hey, man, I love you, dog. And he's like, I love you too, man. And it's such a beautiful space to operate from because it's a place of where we can all just feel like, you know what? That's all we, that's all we really want. We all want to be seen. We want to be heard and we want to be loved. And I had to learn. And here's the other thing. Talk about love, man. I had to learn. I've always known I was, I was loved, but it came a point in my life when I had to realize who unconditionally loves me. And when I started to realize and sort of pinpoint who unconditionally loves me, I was good then. Then I started. Then I started. My wings started kind of expanding, and I started taking off and soaring because I knew that no matter what I did, no matter where I went, no matter if things didn't work out, I had my people that were going to love me unconditionally. This is so beautiful. I mean, we we you know words are so powerful. We have to be thoughtful how we use them. The word love. I love your shoes. Uh uh-uh, uh. I like your <laughs> shoes. I love your. Step when you walk in there. Yes. Uh, you know, you talk about being vulnerable and um, being open to love. What was that process like for writing your book then? Because I'm sure you had to go completely vulnerable. Was yes. there a for you? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So from a therapeutic standpoint, I think what it, I, I, I think the book writing process, although this wasn't the intention when I embarked on the journey, um, it, it, it was quickly clear to me that I had spent a lot of the years just trying to reach the next thing, the next goal, the, the, the the next dream, right? Trying to capitalize on all these opportunities that were presenting themselves because I don't know how much longer I'll have this opportunity and this window will be there. And so I was just trying to capitalize on as much as I could. And so the the book writing process was 100% an opportunity for me to sit still and really reflect. And there were some things that were brought up that, yeah, that was a little difficult. I mean, those were tough, tough things to relive. Um, I mean, our, my mother was a victim of domestic abuse and I witnessed that as a kid and, you know, and, and I, I, I mean, it was, it was the routine of if he, and she was with him for a few years and, and on any given, you know, weekend when he was sitting there drinking his beers and, you know, something triggered him, he would take it out of my four foot 11 mother. And it was routine that when he started to do this, I had to pick up the phone and I had to run to the closet and I had to call 911, tell him our address, tell him what was happening. I was five years old doing this. I was six years old doing this, seven years old doing this. And, you know, that was tough to relive that. That was tough to remember because, you know, our bodies, our minds, at least our minds, I'm going to scratch that out. Not our bodies, our minds 
are constantly trying to protect us and forget things. And there's a great book that um, is titled The Body Keeps Score. And, 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 and I'm such a believer in that because our minds may forget a situation or an event, but our bodies hold on to that trauma until you actually, I mean, and it surfaces in certain ways and it's all different for all of us, right? I mean, hell, somebody calls you and all of a sudden, why do you get that knot in your throat? Why do you get that pit in your stomach? Why do you get like antsy? Why do you start sweating? Why do you start, I, I, I can't speak right now. And it's like, because your body's telling you there's something about that that's triggering you and alarming you. And some of those trigger alarms are valid. And some of those are just alarms because the body is like, hey, no, this isn't good. Remember, this isn't good. And you have to tell your body, I'm good. We got this. It's okay. We're all right. Right. We can lean into this. Yeah, absolutely. Have to heal it. And once you do that, then you can start telling your body and reprogramming it to not be alarmed. And part of that healing in many regard, many ways comes from boundaries and, and mm -hmm. boundaries. Ooh, what a powerful word. And it's a very difficult thing for us to do because we believe that, oh, boundaries are only to be set with people that are, you know, not in our immediate family. Right. Uh, or, 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 and it's like, nah, sometimes, sometimes those are the people you really need to establish boundaries with. Just saying, like maybe some of those other people that you got to do, it's easy to do it with other people, people, colleagues, or, you know, somebody, a neighbor, it's easy to do it with those people. But when you have a parent or a spouse or children or, you know, a family member that is constantly, you know, that maybe you start to do an inventory in yourself and you're like, why do I feel this? Why does this always happen when I have a conversation or when this person's name pops up on my phone, whether it's a text or a phone call, maybe you should do some inventory and maybe you should really pay attention to that and maybe boundaries need to be set. Um, so for me, the book writing process, yes, it, it brought up a lot of that stuff. And, but it also in the same token of where my mother, you know, I remember one time, you know, I called the police and they took him away. And the next day my mother were, my mother and I were out running errands and my mother was just smiling like she just won the lotto. I mean, the biggest smile on her face, like everything was perfect. And I remember looking at her and I was just so confused by this. And I remember asking her, why are you smiling so much? Because I know what just happened. And she said something that was confusing at the time, became very profound and poetic in many ways. Um, she said, I smile to invite the blessings. She said, I smile because if there's something that is coming our way, that's going to bless us, I'll be able to receive it. If I'm not smiling, I don't receive it. I can't even see it. Now, as I got older, I was like, oh, that's such a beautiful, wow. But then as I got older, I started realizing that's part of my mother's sort of superpower, if you will. She never had the opportunity to really grieve. She didn't have the time, the luxury to be able to sit down and cry and really cry. She didn't have resources where she can go to somebody. She can, she couldn't go to her employer and be like, Hey, I need a mental health day. Right. Like I need a day. No, she didn't have that luxury. Um, for many reasons for, 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 because she was from, she was an undocumented immigrant for so long and then she became a citizen, but then she was still a woman in this society and also a woman that didn't speak English that well. And, and, and then she didn't have the financial resources and the freedom. And so she just sort of kind of, that was her way of just trying to survive. That was her survival, you know. You, you, you're, you're sovereign and you know, we lean into gospel songs in and out of the church. And mm -hmm. I being a kid and throughout my adulthood I've leaned back into this song it's about it asks the question in the beginning of the song why should I be discouraged right mm -hmm. and then it goes I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free it's mm -hmm. all right it's all right 
scares me. That's a God inviting the smile, inviting the opportunity. Your mother was wise, so yeah. good, so strong to recognize that gift. And she's gifted you with that energy and that synergy to life. JR, I mean, think about it. You become a prominent advocate for veterans and burn survivors, people thrivers, right? People thriving. Mm -hmm. On a day-to-day -day basis, though, there have got to be some key issues that you become passionate about. You're laughing. Go there. Go, go, go. Go there. <laughs> Listen, you know, and, and, and to your point, to your point about, you know, you know, that, so so that book writing process, even though it brought up a lot of things that may have been difficult, it also brought in those reminders and those beautiful blessings. It also, as I wrote about the time and my recovery, and yes, that was a difficult time. It also reminded me that, oddly enough, when I sat down and I reflected on stories and people and the time I spent in the hospital, I missed it. Mm. I missed being in the hospital. And it wasn't because I liked people poking on me. It's because I didn't, it's not because I liked, you know, people coming in the middle of the night and, you know, drawing blood or take, checking vitals and waking me up and eating the food that they serve you. And I, it wasn't because of all that stuff. It was because of the people. It was because of the way the people made me feel. It was because of the way the people showed up. They loved what they did and they found pride and purpose in it every single day when they showed up and I felt that and they worked outside of the scope of work if you will they worked outside of the job description parameters and they showed up as human beings and they were my therapists and they were my friends and so the book writing process really although it it, it highlighted pain of course it also brought up all these beautiful memories that in many ways I had forgotten um, because I've just been so busy living, creating new ones, but it allowed me to really reflect and appreciate on the journey. And so when people say, hey, you know, never look back, uh, I kind of disagree to some degree. I, I don't think you can drive down a road always looking back, but I think it is helpful every now and then for you to pause and look in that mirror and look behind you and see how far you've come, see what you've accomplished, see what you've endured and see what you've survived. And that's going to help you for that next intersection up ahead for the next 17 miles, 1700 miles, whatever it may be. Um, but as far as like, you know, the things that, you know, I think the thing that I frequently see as a father and as a husband in my home of four, I see that there are a lot of things that I'm still need, I still need to work on. Uh, I see that there are things where, you know, patterns that were in, you know, habits and, and traits that I was introduced to that I sort of live by as a, as a child that find themselves creeping in. Like I find, I remember, I never forget my daughter was four and a half years old and I, and, and um, she, you know, there's an interesting story there um, in regards to my wife and I, my wife and I, after a year, my daughter was a year old, we separated. And it wasn't mm -hmm. like, hey, are we just going to spend a little time away from each other? No, it was 100% a clear break. We were not in the same house. We were doing the visitations. We, it was legit. And my mm -hmm. daughter came to me on a Friday and she was going to be with me for the weekend. And I remember that Friday evening, getting ready for bed. She said, I miss mommy. And, mm -hmm. and I said to her, I said, well, you just saw mommy and you're going to see her in a couple of days. You're with daddy right now. Don't you, don't you, don't you love daddy? You don't love daddy? And she's like, I do love you. I do love you. I just miss mommy. And I was like, and, you know, and I got triggered and I guilted my daughter mm -hmm. and I let her go to sleep with that guilt. And I called that guy, my boy, Dan. And I said, man, this is what I just did. And he said, all right, you identified it. How do you fix it? And the next morning, my four and a half year old daughter, who's, you know, there's only so much she can comprehend, but I told her, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Daddy made a mistake and for her to comprehend and understand. And so I think for me, what, what, what I constantly am working on is trying to break a lot of these patterns and trying to, you know, listen, there was a long history of me when things felt like they got difficult. When, when, when I was on the verge of being vulnerable, I ran away from people. I ran away from relationships. 
and you know listen it all shook out the way it was supposed to and i'm happy where i am but i'm also still learning how to continue to lean in and be that example for my children um and my wife too i mean for all of us we're all teaching each other and so i think those are daily daily things that you know i i i, I have a struggle for a long time you know, disappointment was a difficulty for me. I mean, people were constantly disappointing me. People would say, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to help you. And then weeks and months would go by and I'd circle back and they would all get frustrated. Like, Hey, Hey, we got other things we're doing first. And I'm like, well, don't waste my time. Like, and then I, you know, I became frustrated and disappointed in people, but I've realized I'm in this space in life where I realized I've kind of put a lot of my life on, other people managing things and I realized that I need to take control and I need to be the one that's going to sort of you know drive this shit. I'm the captain now as they say right in the movie and so you know I realized that I need to be the captain I need to take ownership of this and I need to direct this thing and whoever's along for the ride hey let's go because it'll be one hell of a ride amen and you know you talk about your relationship to your daughter and how you self-correct it the next day um, if I recall correctly, you have a motto or a mantra that says like, it, it speaks to being your, your own hero no matter what. How do you define being your own hero and not blurring the line toward narcissism? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, one, I don't, I don't foresee myself as a hero or anything of that nature. I know what I've accomplished. I know what I've done. Um, yet I don't perceive myself to be that. Um, I think for me, kind of like what you, what you talked about earlier with your children, I think it's just, I trust my kids. I trust my wife. I know that their intentions are not to hurt me. And so when they sit down and they say, hey, you're kind of not taking accountability for something. I may not agree with it and I may not like it, but I'm like, damn, is there is there truth in that? Is there some truth in the fact that maybe I haven't really been accountable? Like I'm not really being apologetic about something that I did. Or you know what? Maybe that maybe I did tell them to do certain thing and then and then not do it the not be hypocrites and and or double standard and I maybe I'm doing that and so when they sit me down and they talk to me and they tell me I think for me it's just it's just you got to understand the people you love and trust and I've identified those people and I know who those people are my best friend Dan is always telling me about myself and I'm telling him about himself and I'm like hey man you, know, you got to chill on that energy with towards this or that or with this person and that person and he tells me hey man why is that bothering you so much i'm like ah and so i think for me it's just a matter of really just doing inventory of knowing who the people are that are in your corner that got your back through and through i love that i love that so much and i mean love, love in the strongest sense of the word <laughs> um it's it, it's kind of it's kind of like um being certain you remember to ask the question is there what is in here for somebody else huh mm -hmm. what is in here for somebody else? Mm -hmm. you, you you speak a lot you have so much wisdom jr what's your advice for young people who may be thinking of joining the military we're in a point in the world right now where there's a lot of disruption a lot of disturbance and a lot of discontinence and you, you you know, I remember being younger, you talked about seeing a commercial on TV that inspired you in your own uh, sense to join the Army. I remember a commercial that kind of went, be all that you can be in the <laughs> Army. Army. <laughs> and I remember it, it rang back for me as you were talking, right? And I, I remember that during the time I grew up, which was, you know, all those years ago, uh, <laughs> our community, the majority, and it was it was a Southern community. I'm sure you know a little bit about my history. I grew up in the mm -hmm. South, pre Civic, and Panola Street divided white from black community, and that was it, with the exception yeah. of a couple of Jewish families who were not received into the white community as white. JR, I remember that when Vietnam hit, 
um, men on mass from my community went to Vietnam and they were front line. Many yeah. of them came back boxes. So I thank you, thank you deeply for your service. I remember my brother thank telling you. me the freedom we enjoy is not free in this country. It's at the expense and the price paid by many people. Um, and so I, 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 so many people since then have joined the military because it was the opportunity, not an opportunity right. to advance life. There is a lot of stigma there. I think I heard uh, the, um, I think I heard the top military official of this country state that we have a deficit in yeah. women and men joining the military now. Yeah. What is your advice for young people thinking of joining the military? And where do you think the line for encouragement to join the military exists when talking with young people? I know that's a big question. Yeah, no, it's a great question though. And I think I think the way that we in my in my opinion, I think the way that we combat the shortage of individuals willing to join the military and serve in the military, I think we have to do a better job of taking care of them when they come home. Now, there are countless stories that have made, you know, the news that have, you know, graced our social media pages and of service members not feeling that they've had all the resources or people haven't responded or, you know, their benefits available to them. I mean, my best friend has a, a small nonprofit here in Texas and he's constantly calling me, telling me he interacted with the Vietnam vet. Um, he interacted with, you know, the older veterans and how they didn't even real. I mean, there was a veteran that was living in, in a, in a, in a, in a, a mobile home, like a really small mobile home. And they needed, he, they needed a ramp and they reached out to his organization and he showed up to, to kind of assess and see kind of what the situation was. And he looked at the home and he said, man, this, this is, this is not good living conditions. I mean, we can do the ramp, but that's not going to fix all these other things that issues you have. And so he was able to get, you know, a new one, a, a bigger home um, donated and that had a ramp. And, and then my best friend was like, Hey, well, let's talk about your benefits. What benefits do you have? And they said, well, you know, we fought for a long time and we just kind of gave up and, you know, I'm, I'm only like 30% rated through the VA and, my best friend started the paperwork for him and now he's a hundred percent disabled. Um, and what that means for them is this is a man that served in Vietnam and, and has lived with the trauma that he experienced in conflict and him and his wife to feed themselves. were going to a, a local food bank to get food and because they didn't have enough money to survive and they were living in these conditions where they were making probably like five, 600 bucks a month because she had to be a caregiver to him and look after him. And they went from that to now being a hundred percent where now they're getting well over $3,500 a month. And now they donate to the food bank where they used to get the food from. And that's just, that's just one of unfortunately many, 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 many stories out there. And I think that we have to do a better job of taking care of them. Now, from a medical standpoint, I received the best care in the world. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of service members when they're injured, they're treated. But for but once they get out or for those that aren't injured in a physical way, right. I mean, because I mean, there's a lot of troops that have the, 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 the hidden scar, as we talk about, right? And so I think we have to, we, ha we just have to do a better job. And I think People are reluctant to join the military because of the fear of like, well, if I'm willing to put my life on the line for a country, is the country willing to fight for me? Is the country willing to take care of me and defend me? And I think we have to, you know, the, we have to change that narrative and we have to do a better job of taking care of. So that's, that's, that's what I see first and foremost. Now, as far as, you know, what I, what do I tell, you know, people that want to join the military? And I have a lot of parents that come up to me and say, my son or daughter or my nephew or niece are thinking about joining, you know, what would you say to them? And a lot of them say, tell them no. And I say, well, I'm not one to say do it or don't do it. What I will say is 
just be smart about what it is that you want to do. I think that's the key. Like, right. You need the fighters. You need the frontliners. I mean, I was one of those, but I kind of naively jumped into it and I'm going to be an infantryman and I'm going to go fight. And had I, had I not been injured, what, what would have been the transition from the military and being an infantryman to getting the job in this, in the civilian world, as we call it, right? Like there's probably very few streamlining opportunities for me to be able to do things in the civilian sector. Um, and so I, I've always encouraged, hey, what is it that you're interested in? What is it that you're passionate about? I, I lived in New York for a long time. My wife was a born and raised New Yorker. And and in New York, we all know is incredibly diverse. And I and I've lived in a lot of places, and I feel like the second place that it's incredibly diverse is the military. There's a lot of diversity in the military, and not only just from a people, but from what you can do, because the military needs everything. And so, what is it that you're passionate about? What is it that excites you? What is it that you can potentially leverage the military to spend all this money on giving you the extensive training to do it at the best of your ability in the military. But then when you get out, whether it be three years, whether it be 10, whether it be 25, you can then easily transition into, hey, I'm gonna go into the workforce and I have this skill set, I have this training. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't persuade people, sway people away from, you know, joining. Um, I don't try to persuade people to join. I want people to understand that there is always a possibility of deployment. There is also a poss there is always a possibility of being in conflict. There is always a possibility of the unfortunate, which is either being wounded, um, being unfortunately making the ultimate sacrifice, or even witnessing someone being wounded or making the ultimate sacrifice. There was always that reality. And you really have to do a gut check with yourself, a reality check and and have that honest conversation if that's something that you're willing to embark on. Um, and not everyone is, and that's okay. And I want people that if, if they have that conversation with themselves and they come to the conclusion and they say, nah, the military is not for me. I want those people to know it's okay. That's fine too. Like you don't have, like you can be a supporter and you can be a huge voice for us because the popular soundbite is less than 1% serving our military, right? That's the popular soundbite, which is true. But if you really think about it, like the people that serve, the family members, the people that work on the bases that are civilians, um, you know, you may be able to round that up to 5% of our nation's population are, are either in the military or around it. So that leaves the rest, 95% of us that have maybe no connection, no direct day-to-day -day connection with anybody in the military or the military in general. So what that tends to ha what tends to happen is that when elections come around, when certain you know advocacy or campaigns to fight for veterans rights comes around guess what a lot of people don't get behind it because it doesn't affect them and what i want people to understand is that even though you may not decide to serve or you never served or whatever that's fine but then be a supporter really be an advocate help us go from five percent strong of being a voice and trying to scream from the mountaintops that we need help and we need resources and help us expand to 10 percent 25 percent 50 percent 70 percent of the nation that is behind our military and our service members and their families to help them get the things that they earned not that they um, forget the word deserve they earned these things i mean this was the agreement i would do this you will do that and until they start consistently doing that for all of us and really put an emphasis on mental health as well and taking care of our service members from an emotional and mental standpoint. Um, I think you're going to continue to see that deficit. Well, I pray that we can shift that. I certainly think that an advocate and uh, such a strong supporter and example as you are will help that. Um, and I, I thank you. Thank you. You thank you for your service. You know, in our company, the Act One Group, we have many military and military spouses and families who were. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it, here last year, I don't know if you're familiar with a show called Military Makeover, but mm -hmm. we were the feature company. So you may be able to go find our episode, Act One Group, We Work Where You Work. And oh, the wow. story, the stories that came forward. 
from members of our own company about um, opportunities, heroism, touching stories, uh, as you uh, share, heroism. It, it, it just, it, it was so filling and so full. It makes me think that while you say, yeah, maybe we can get 70% behind our military, but you know what? The truth is, JR, 100% of us benefit from it. So yeah. we have to find ways to be better citizens. And I think a requirement and, of citizenship should be and I think, to find. And I think, yeah, sorry, to, sorry, to, sorry to interject, but I think, you know, to that point, I think when, you know, it's easy for us to look at, you know, um, the military or first responders or anybody in on a frontline position and just kind of, you know, be like, wow, I admire them for what they do and, and sort of say, well, that's them and they deal with that and that's what they do and sort of create a disconnect there. But again, there's a lot of intersectionality between all of our lives. And, and, and I think that if we all sat down with a spouse or with a service member and we truly listen and we were truly, you know, asking them, you know, we're so conditioned to say thank you for your service and believe that that's enough. And the reality is, Half the time, people don't know what the hell they're thanking them for. Like, we know you we know you went away somewhere. We know you sacrificed something, but we don't know what. And so what I always encourage people to do is instead of just saying thank you for your service, why don't you ask them about their service? Ask them what they did. Yeah. Because now you're creating connection. Now you're creating depth. And through that, you're finding intersectionality between, between your world and between their world. And now you're connected mm -hmm. on a human level yeah, and you you know, Jr. Even if you're not connecting around the idea of war and conflict, there's also peacekeeping, and there's yep. also natural disaster needs. I mean, I, think about it. When we have had many natural disasters over these last few years, it's been the military that stepped in and helped yep. so often. You and I yep. likely could have a conversation around that. Um, I, because I'm in the jobs business, I happen to know that there are many transferable skills that occur through training in the military that put you in a much better position when you exit the military. I just really think we can't do enough justice to the role of the military and of service people in this country who help to defend, yes, also to peace keep around the world. And I think that's where we should kind of frame this is, you know, around, around the good and the lives that we have because of the military and the lives that the people in the military live. I 100%, 100% agree with that. 100% agree with that. Let's roll to something a little more lighthearted. You know, I shared with you how thrilled I was on your win of season 13 of ABC's Dancing with the Stars. Which I watched, voted, and rooted for you on. You're the Thank only you so much. that I ever voted for, okay? Now, you are a favorite for my family. I mean, my mom and my sister, who are passionate Dancing with the Stars fans. My mom transcended several months ago, JR, and Dancing with the Stars was one of the last shows she watched along with her Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. Those were the oh, three shows. That, and she complained that, um, that, that Jeopardy got too easy. <laughs> she, loved, she loved Wheel of Fortune, but Dancing with the Stars stayed a favorite of hers. So hands down, you've impacted my family and me, not just through military service, but through the oh, joy thank you. you brought to life. Um, <laughs> everybody, what you said was your goal for competing on Dancing with the Stars and about your being the Grand Marshal of the 2012 Rose Parade. Yeah, you know, my goal for going on Dancing with the Stars was to show people that I was so much more than what they thought. And, and like I said, I had been screaming prior to going on that show in 2011, I'd been screaming from the mountaintops for eight years that I was so much more and I had so much more to bring to the table and value to add to society and all people saw because they weren't really listening. They were just hearing me. And so, you know, all people saw was, like I said, a disabled veteran 
a burn victim. And we just, they just kind of hyper-focused on, on the disabled and the victim word versus kind of seeing other traits and um, elements that I brought to the table. And so, you know, I wanted people to, sh I wanted to show people that, you know what, service members, uh, we may be pegged as guys that are stiff and, and I'm specifically speaking for the men here that, you know, we may be pegged as stiff and can't move and got no hip action and can't, you know, put ourselves in those two inch Latin hills and get down. Yeah. And I want to yeah, I, yeah, I wanted to show people we got range, we got personality, we got rhythm, we got musicality, you know, like there's that we got all those things. And, um, and, you know, listen, I just wanted to go on that show and just have fun and just be me and connect with people. And I think, and I always jokingly talk about how, you know, I was able to beat a Kardashian and how difficult that was just because the Kardashian machine and how many people they have that root for them and follow them. But yet, you know, I was able to penetrate homes like yours and your mother's, which God rest her soul, and just, you know, was able to reach people and connect with people on a human level. I think people resonated with that. They loved to see that I was somebody that was just completely surprised that every week people were showing up to vote for me and to keep me around another week. And they loved to see that I was just really embracing and enjoying the moment. And I had a blast. I mean, you know, in that ballroom where they shoot the show, and uh, in that studio, I should say, <laughs> they they could fit about 700 people uh, in, in, inside. And what I started realizing is on show days, there was a long line when you came into the set, into the lot. There was a long line of people waiting to get into the show. And, you know, I didn't I didn't I didn't need hair or makeup. Like, what was I going to do? So I was just sitting there, even though I had a hair and makeup call time. Like I didn't need I was just sitting there. So. What I started doing is I would, uh, well, first time I went out there by myself and I was like, I'm just going to go say hi to the people. I'm just going to say hello and just meet people, maybe take a couple of photos. And it turned into a bigger deal than, cause I was incredibly naive. And the security guy was like, man, you can't do that. Like you go out there, you got to come get us. And so it became a thing where every week we security rolled up and it said, Hey, you ready to go out? And I'm like, yeah, we'd go out and see people. And for 90 seconds, when I performed, I was just telling a story. And whatever that story was for that style of dance, I was just telling a story. Karina and I, we just told a story. And that's what I love to do, was just tell stories. And so I just had fun in that. And so for me, um, I think that was the objective of, of going on that show, the goal. And then, of course, listen, when I agreed to be the Grand Marshal for the Rose Parade, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I'm a football guy. I love sports. I love football. And I just agreed to do it because I wanted to go to the Rose Bowl. And that was mm -hmm. it. And I remember when I when I showed up in Pasadena, California, to the to the to the house where, you know, that's their headquarters. And I showed up there because we were going to make the announcement and they took me into a room and they showed me all the past grand marshals and they had all these photos up on the wall that was when it really hit me and i was like oh 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 this is a big deal this isn't just about a football game like the honor it is to be the grand marshal for this parade i'm looking at past politician i'm looking at past public figures entertainers i'm looking at you know philosophers i'm looking at and i'm looking at all these you know incredible people and I'm like, now my picture's up there on that wall? Um, it was something I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, and it was one of the most memorable, exciting, beautiful experiences of my life um, to be able to have that experience. And I, I, I haven't been back since I was the Grand Marshal. Um, and I got to make sure I get myself back because it is, if you can ever make yourself out to Pasadena, for those watching, uh, for to experience it in person. It is a beautiful thing um, to see sort of a clash of all these beautiful cultures, cultures and, you know, just the creativeness come together. JR, you are a memorable, exciting, and beautiful human being. Your oh, journey, thank you, love. as you say, your story embodies resilience and hope and perseverance and joy and winning. Is there Anything else you want to share with us before we go four for four? No, listen, I think you and I have unpacked a lot. I think we've covered a lot of ground. And I think 
the only thing that I would encourage everyone to do is I think there's a lot of times that you're listening to this while you're on the move and trying to do this and do that, or you're watching while you're still trying to do this and do that. And so I would just encourage people to, you know, maybe kind of come back to this episode, re-listen to some things. And, you know, I love using this metaphor where I always talk about, let's say you're going to lunch with some friends and you got 20 bucks in your pocket and you come across a penny on the sidewalk. Well, you don't need to pick up that penny because you got 20 bucks in your pocket and you step right over it and you get to lunch and you decide I'm going to add this and I'm going to add that. And before you know it, they ring you up and they t- tell you that'd be $20 or one cent. And now you're looking for that penny. But you go back to pick it up and it's gone. Someone else picked it up. And the point of that is simply just because you think you have everything that you need right now at this point in life, somebody, something is always dropping some change. And just because you don't think it's beneficial to you, to you where you are in that very moment, you still pick it up and you still put, put it in your pocket. Because five steps from that point, 50 steps from that point, 5,000 steps from that point, you're going to wish you picked up all the change along the way. And so for me, that's what I would encourage people is like, listen, I don't care. I don't know where you are in your life right now, and that's fine. But come back to this episode, maybe listen to some of these stories, some of listen to these anecdotes, and maybe some of this will help you through whatever it is you're going through. With gratitude. Thank you. Thank Let's you go lot. four for four, Jim. So oh, this like- is that this is this is where I'm nervous. This is where I get nervous now. No nervous, just fine. Uh, look, look, let it shine. Let it shine. <laughs> there are no wrong answers. You're going to give me four answers to each question, okay? Okay. And the first question, the first question is, you, you get to host the dinner. You may invite four guests to dinner from any time in history to present, as long as they are human, okay? Who's okay. at your table and why? So I'm I'm a I'm a like I said I'm a sports guy, um, football, basketball. I love it. Um, growing up in Arkansas, there wasn't a there wasn't a professional sports team, and this is the '90s, and the Chicago Bulls were at you know were dominating, and I just became a fan of Michael Jordan. And my birthday is in June, and so the finals were always in that same week of my birthday, and sometimes the Bulls would win it on my birthday or day before or day after. And I would always say, Jordan won, won it for me. That's my birthday present. And so for me, Michael Jordan is somebody that I just admire, you know, just the way he played, the way he approached, the way he prepared. Um, obviously what he's created just from an entrepreneurial standpoint, from a business standpoint, and also his philanthropy work. Um, so I think Michael Jordan would definitely be somebody just because I would love to just kind of hear all of those stories and really pick his brain on just so many things just because I'd geek out on that. Um, I'd probably say um, President Barack Obama. Um, you know, I've had the luxury of, of being able to be around his wife, Michelle Obama, a few times and delightful and pleasant and beautiful and um, and so I think he would be somebody that I just admire, just not even, you know, politically, just just the, the human being, the way he carries himself and what he's accomplished. So that would be somebody um, I'd probably say Gandhi. I think, uh, you know, just from the just the philosoph- like just there's so much wisdom and philosophical things that are being thrown out. And I'd probably say Maya Angelou, like um, she's somebody that I love. Her work, I, you know, I love her. I, I, there's constantly quotes that I'm, you know, repeating back to people and just admire all the work she did. And so those are the four people that I think uh, I think we'd be able to have a good time. And, you know, Obama plays ball, too. So he'd be able to cut up with me and Jordan. And then, you know, and then I think all of us would be able to just sit back and listen to Maya and just let her like just kind of tell these stories the way she did and. Um, and, you know, so I think it, I think that would be a pretty entertaining table for me. It's a fantastic table for you. <laughs> the truth is, I think each of them would enjoy each other so much as well. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> OK, let's go two for four, JR. All um, right. What four pieces of music or author um, or or musicians are you listening to right now? And why? Oh, so I, I I love me some Otis Redding. 
Um, <laughs> I love me some Otis Ready, man. Like I am an Otis Ready. Um, I love him, man, and just sad that his life was cut short. But you think about all the pieces of just magic he created in a short amount of time. It's a beautiful thing. And so I just love, he just puts me in a space, man. Like I just love vibing with him. Um, so my 11 year old daughter, I pop it in and she's like, oh no. And I'm like, no, 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 just, just, just roll with it, girl. Just roll with it. It feels good. Trust me, trust me, lean into it. Um, so I'd say Otis Redding, um, I, you know, I, I, listen, I grew up loving hip hop, um, but, <laughs> But a lot of it is like, you know, can't really be playing around the kids. And so I've kind of like, I've kind of pivoted a little bit to where like, I've kind of discovered in the last few years, this uh, Christian hip hop, like, and I love this oh, Christian hip hop thing. And they vibe, they get yeah. me hyped up too. And I can play it loud with the kids and I can actually get behind it. Cause I'm like, oh yeah, here we go. So Lecrae is somebody that I listen to a lot. KB is somebody that I listen to a lot um i'm trying to think of somebody else i um i go through these phases where there's different people that just kind of put me into different zones and um i listen to you know listen the one thing about me as i said i'm hispanic my father's mexican my mother's salvadorian but i grew up with a lot of mexicans and um and so i love i love to go back to my roots and i listen to you know um you may not know any of these groups, but like Juan Gabriel, who was like a big, you know, artist and, and, a, and a big figure for the Latino community, but also like Los Tucanes de Tijuana, anything, Banda Recoda, anything that takes me back to sort of my roots and my culture. I love that stuff. Yeah, don't count me short. My family is fully diverse. My nieces have a Mexican father. My son has a Guatemalan wife. Oh, you get, you get it. You get it. You get it. You 100% get it there. So you understand. So, so like, I mean, I'm always like sitting here, like, I used to say, even beyond that, the music is so, even beyond that, the music is so contagious. I mean, imagine what the human being has done with seven notes, you know, sometimes. Yep. Yep. And I love I'm it, man. And like, I remember, I remember um, th there was a, um, a band called Los Rehenes and, and they would sing these love songs. And I, my mom, the guy that she was dating when I was young, he used to play the piano and he would sit there in the house and he had a cigarette in his mouth and, you know, he needed to dump those ashes. And somehow, I don't know how people do that with a cigarette and the ashes are like hanging like this, but they don't fall off that cigarette and they're just hanging on. And I would come and he was probably the closest thing to a father figure that I ever had. And I'd come over, I'd take the cigarette, dump the ashes and put it back in his mouth. And I'd sit next to him at the piano and he would say, play these, these Spanish songs and sing. And I would sing because my first language was Spanish and I didn't learn English till I started school, even though I was born in the States. And so I used to go to him, go with him to this local bar where there'd probably be like 10 people there and he'd play and I'd sing Spanish love songs. I was like six years old singing Spanish love songs, talk about heartache and, and, and love and all these beautiful things, man. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> so now we're going three for four. All right. What four books do you recommend our family read and why? Um, in yours as well. <laughs> although yeah. we will, be, although we, although we are sharing yours. <laughs> oh well, thank you. Um, I would say, um, the five love languages. I think that is an important book, and even though one, when you hear that, you think if you haven't read the book or have heard of the book, you may think, oh, that is that to for my spouse. And I'm like, no, I think it's important to understand the different love languages for people. I think it'll help you be able to understand people differently, be able to connect with them differently. I think that, I, th I think personally, I've used that stuff to understand what my wife's lo love languages are. Um, I I've used that to understand what my daughter's love language is. I already know what my son's love languages are, like my best friend, people I come in contact with. So I think that that to me, 
it's good to be able to kind of get a little insight into what maybe are the, the factors that motivate people. And then you can sort of meet them where they are. Um, I made a book. Uh, I read a book a few years ago. I've, I've man, haven't read in a long time, but it was a book that I would actually pick up probably every three to four years. And it was, it's the alchemist. Um, mm -hmm. The alchemist is such an incredible book. And it was one of those books where I found myself, if I read it now, I would get something and it's kind of like that change, you know, where, where then I would read it in a few months or a few years and I'd pick up something completely different. And so it all depended on where you were in life. Um, and also a book that I love is, um, it's called The Shack. And uh, the author is um, William Young. Yeah, William Young. And um, yeah, and, and it was such, such a beautiful story. And, and I don't want to give too much away, but I think it's one of those stories that I think can relate, all of us can relate to. And then last but not least, gosh, there's so many good books. But last but not least, I'd probably say The Four Agreements. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I think The Four Agreements uh, is just a, a good, quick, easy read, but it just, it, it hits you. It hits you. It drives a point home. So I think those would be my four. Those would be, yeah, those would be my four. I'm, I'm in the, I, I recently finished The Body Keeps Score, uh, which I said is a great book. I mean, I mean, if I turn my camera around, you would see a wall full of books. And I haven't spent a lot of time reading over the last few years, but that's one of the things I'm trying to get back to doing is getting back to reading and uh, just kind of soaking up all that knowledge that's out there. That's the thing I love is, you know, books. And um, even though I buy so many digitally, when one really hits it for me and I love it, I give homage to the author and I buy it in print. I understand that's really important and measure yep. to their success. I give it to them. So my library is finished with walls of books, but they're books that I've actually read. <laughs> and I get yeah. so many Authors and the books are beautiful and they're placed well. And I'm thinking, if I open it up, do I see marks in it? Do I see, you know, I mean, I'm right. in my book. <laughs> I just well, you know, it. especially have... especially during COVID, when all of us figured out we had to have, you know, a studio in our houses, and then all of a sudden, all those books that we collected, we didn't, we never read them, but we used them as props to put our our laptops higher up. So. <laughs> You know, but it was like, hey, why don't you take that damn computer from underneath that laptop and read it? <laughs> read that book. Yeah. Okay. okay, we're going four for four. You've given right. beautiful, beautiful thought to this conversation. If we've not exhausted you, please share with us four pieces of advice you think is important for our family to have. And if it was gifted you by someone else, then yes, do give homage to the author of the advice. So I think the first thing is, and we touched on it a lot in this conversation, was really practice vulnerability. Um, that was something that my best friend taught me. I believe that it has allowed me to create deeper connection and with people and the work that I do. And so I think practicing vulnerability, and it doesn't have to be on the scale of you're talking on a podcast with a lot of people watching. It can be literally with you and someone in your life. Uh, it could be one person. It can be a parent. It can be uh, a partner. It could be a best friend. It could be a colleague. I mean, it could even be your kid. Um, I mean, hell, I talk to my two and a half year old right now. He don't know what I'm saying half the time. But, you know, I talk to them and, you know, but it's kind of my way of kind of working through things. Um, so I feel like that's important um, because I think that all that's going to do is just allow us to be able to let our guard down and allow ourselves to really heal uh, through and through. Um, I think, man, I think, I think you, you, you really have to bench. Um, hmm. Four things. I think you have to be a lifelong learner. You have to commit to that. Um, you know, you may have had a goal to reach this point in your life to make this dream become a reality, and maybe you've reached it, and that's fantastic. But it's not done 
it's not done. You're not done. You still are learning. You're still are challenging. I mean, with the innovation of technology and now that being in everything that we do, I think that's important to be able to, you know, to always be a lifelong learner and commit to that work. Um, and so I think uh, that is important. And I say patience. I say be patient. I think um, we 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 get caught up in and like we need to have things now and everything in life is about timing. Everything in life is about timing. And, you know, I had a conversation with my daughter recently about timing and, um, you know, she was like, oh, this is not happening. And I was like, yeah, but everything in life has its time. And there's a reason why it's not happening right now. Either we couldn't fully embrace it and appreciate it. Maybe we couldn't fully show up for it. Uh, maybe the opportunity was going to pull us away from other great things that we should be working on right now. It doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. It doesn't mean that it's, it's done. Um, but, um, you know, timing is everything. And so just practice patience and, oh, listen, there's two that I'm really struggling with. Um, you know, I'm going to have to probably ask for a mulligan here and see if I can get another one in there. But I'm going to say the importance of practicing, uh, finding gratitude, finding gratitude. I think if you can find gratitude and a lot of things, whatever you're going through in life, I think uh, those are important things. And last but not least, I don't know that's five, is find a way to just laugh. Just laugh. Just have fun. Just, just laugh at yourself. Laugh at things that happen. Just, just, it is what it is. You're okay. You're fine. You'll make it out of this, you know, and um, just find ways to laugh through life because there's so many things to enjoy and to, you know, just to be able to just have a sense of humor about. And I think my sense of humor has carried me in so many ways and has allowed me to just connect with people on a deeper level. JR, this has been an incredible conversation. Not only have you caught our hearts, you've caught so much of what we really needed. So from my heart to your home, thank you.